Okay, so if we come back to this idea of building your aerobic base, how much of this would you say is influenced by mitochondrial function versus the amount of oxygen that we have available, our VO2 max? Yeah, that's another great question. So, um, and this is something that we have learned a lot in, in the last two or three decades. So, um, we used to measure performance or predict performance based on VO2 max, right? And, uh, and it is still, it's, it's a very good parameter because, uh, um, um, it's, it's, uh, it represents the cardiorespiratory adaptations to exercise. But um, definitely, and, and, and that's for sure, and this anybody can, who, who does a lot of testing, physiological and metabolic testing can tell you that uh, VO2 max is not, um, uh, it doesn't discriminate, right? So it gets to a point that is so well expressed uh, that uh, it, it doesn't make the difference. And this is what we see all the time. You, you see two athletes with the same VO2 max, right? So therefore... Um, um, yeah, they're, they supposedly are as good. Um, and then one athlete is much better than the other, right? And then you go at the cellular level, right? Um, and then you see that, yes, at, at, uh, that, that, that athlete at 350 watts has eight millimoles of lactate and the other one has three or four, right? Despite of the same VO2 max. So, so this is why VO2 max, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it's a great surrogate for health, of course, and for fitness, no question, right? But, um, you know, looking, and this is from looking for, from a cardiorespiratory standpoint, and this has been the norm, right, for forever, right, VO2 max. But uh, but looking now in, in, in the last two decades, especially at the more cellular level, we're seeing that that's what makes the difference. And within the cellular level, uh, and, you know, uh, everything happens or, or the, the key in, of the or, or, or of the cells uh, or the queen because they come from the mother we should say right um, our mitochondria and when we're thinking about stimulating the mitochondria through zone two training are we mostly thinking about improving the function of those mitochondria or are we also thinking about improving the number of mitochondria that are found within muscle fibers? That's a good question too, and and it's it's usually both, right? So we improve both the number and the function uh, of mitochondria. Um, uh, definitely, I I I I believe, and this is what we still need to do more and more research because there there are different studies showing things, you know. But I uh, I think that uh, in my humble opinion is more the function, uh, but they they usually go together, right? Uh, you see mitochondrial content in type 2 diabetics or obese individuals is significantly lower than in, in moderately active individuals. And when you put uh, those um, um, those athletes um, to, uh, there, there is this great researcher that uh, was from Pittsburgh, uh, Toledo. He started doing uh, these studies where, uh, with mitochondrial function. That was 20 years ago, uh, but not many people listened to him but he was lo- looking at uh, people with obesity and looking at the mitochondrial content in the muscle. And after, um, I believe it was like for God, six months or five months of aerobic training, back in the days they still talk about aerobic training, uh, we, we still do, right? Uh, they improved their, uh, they, they, they tripled the number of mitochondria. So in the same way that you reduce the number by being sedentary, you can increase the number of mitochondria and the size. They triple the number and the size of mitochondria and, and, and the function also was significantly improved. So all things come together. Yeah, so that's worth sort of under, underlining that we're not born with a set number of mitochondria that's fixed for life. We can do something about this. And if I heard correctly, if we've lived one, two, three decades uh, living a very sedentary lifestyle and lost a bunch of mitochondria, if we then commence exercise, particularly specific exercise and do the right dose and frequency, which we'll get into, we can actually build new mitochondria and bring some of these back. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and th- this comes within the plasticity of skeletal muscle. I mean, we're still focusing on skeletal muscle, right? Although it happens also in the heart and in the brain too. 
but uh, the, the plasticity of skeletal muscle is extraordinary. So uh, yeah, uh, yeah it, it can deteriorate uh, over time for sure, and it will if you don't do exercise, and, and it's something that we see on the outside of, of people who don't exercise. But uh, also it can improve significantly over time, as we see also, uh, you know, from the outside of people, you know. But imagine what happens in the inside, right, uh, at the cellular level. Yeah, there's an inc- incredible amount of uh, improvements that happened uh, at the cellular level. So, yeah, and it comes because, yeah, the, the, the body at the end of the day is very wise. And uh, we uh, humans, we haven't evolved to become sedentary. Uh, we are, uh, our genes uh, are still, um, you know, made to be active, right? And uh, being sedentary has been um, a byproduct of progress as opposed to be the norm. But uh, unfortunately, we've been growing, uh, you know, with this notion then, then, and then being sedentary or, or healthy sedentary has been the norm and, and doing physical and being physically active is, 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 is being the control, right? Or it's, a, it's an intervention, right? With that, the real intervention, uh, for, for us humans as part of the evolution has been to become sedentary, which is leading to disease, you know? So this is what I got. Yeah. So a lot of our research data in, in medical research for decades, they've been using as a control the healthy sedentary individuals when we know that the immense majority of those healthy sedentary, um, they, they, they are going to become um, uh, populations with diseases. And we already, we have a, a very interesting study that uh, we, we, we are putting the manuscript together with uh, really cool findings of sedentary people who are healthy, they don't have any clinical conditions, and they already have significant metabolic dysregulations compared to people who are active, uh, moderately active, not elite athletes. So we're already seeing that uh, uh, 15, 20 years probably before they have some disease, uh, we already see signatures, markers of metabolic dysfunction and mitochondrial decay. Right, and one of those, I'm assuming, being lactate as an early predictor of disease. Yeah, yeah, lactate is an early predictor. Uh, we're looking do, doing this by lo- do, looking different markers in the muscle, do, doing muscle biopsies, right, uh, and, and, and metabolomics. We look at uh, a lot of um, uh, metabolites that are happening in mitochondria and looking itself at mitochondrial function, right? Where we where we uh, where we do is like we get a muscle biopsy and we inject it. Uh, we, we we homogenize the mitochondria. Of, 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 of those subjects, and we directly inject in mitochondria different substrates. We inject fatty acids, we inject uh, carbohydrates, um, um, amino acids, and we see how mitochondria metabolize those, right? So we, we see there are significant differences already in, uh, um, in sedentary individuals, and then also some transporters that I cannot say yet until we don't publish it, but there's a key transporter that uh, um, is significantly uh, down-regulated, that, that, that can be 10 years, 15 years ahead of uh, type 2 diabetes. Uh, that is already uh, a signature and could be a hallmark uh, of this population who are sedentary. That's exciting. Sounds very promising. I look forward to reading about that. Uh, what you were talking about earlier about the sedentary lifestyles we're living and the deterioration that, occur- that occurs with that um, reminds me of a quote from Frank Booth. I'm sure you you know him or have come across his work. Uh, he said that the current human genome requires and expects us to be physically active for normal functioning. And I think a, a prior guest, Paul Taylor, shared that with me on my show, and it's kind of stuck in my mind. We have already uh, great examples of uh, very primitive uh, civilizations that still exist in our world. Right. And there, there's uh, so there, there, there are especially two populations: the the Hasda hunter gatherers in Tanzania, and also the Simani uh, uh, hunter gatherer population in Bolivia, right? So the very primitive populations, uh, they 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 don't have any contact, or they haven't had any contact forever with uh, our, with civilization. They haven't even evolved 
they have the same uh, um, uh, tools and the same dresses as they had, you know, like a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, right? Um, uh, so, and and then um, um, there, there there are a few researchers. Um, there uh, there are two, especially uh, uh, um, uh, Ponser uh, uh, and uh, and Kaplan, who just went into these tribes and started to study the incidence of diseases as well as uh, obesity, uh, body fat percentage, uh, their, their habits, uh, how much time they were exercising a day, and as well as what, is, what was their nutrition. Uh, so those are the real primitive civilizations, right? So um, the rate of obesity among these populations was about 2%. We're talking about now uh, o- overweight or obesity in our in our Western or not not Western our civilized world, right? Is uh is somewhere between fifty and seventy percent, right? Uh, type two diabetes in this population was one percent. We're talking that in the U.S. alone, fifty two percent of 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 adults are pre diabetic or diabetic already, right? Um, um and I and, and I always say that. Being pre-diabetic, you know, uh, is it, you already have the disease. There's no term such as being pre-pregnant or pregnant. You're pregnant or you're not, right? So the same thing with pre-diabetes. They also have the lowest cardiovascular disease and atherosclerosis plaque percentage uh, observed in any humans in the world, right? So, uh, and the life expectancy is in fact similar to the U.S. The problem that they have is that, um, like, uh, the majority of fatalities that they have about 70% of fatalities are due to infections. They don't have medications. They don't have antibiotics, right? Uh, and then they have a lot of uh, fatalities due to trauma, accidents, right? Uh, but only about 10% of their deaths are due to non-communicable diseases, whereas in our population, there's about 70%, right, uh, uh, due to uh, um, non-communicable diseases. So, And then the, the habits of these people... Uh, they, they're, they're walking between 110 and 135, 140 minutes a day. So, uh, you know, the American Heart Association, American Medical Association, American, I mean, all these associations there, they're saying about the famous 150 minutes a week, right? That's pretty much what they do a day, right? Um, and then we look at their diet and they're, they're pretty much plant-based diet. They they they're uh, hunter gathered populations. They hunt whenever they can. Probably like the the people in the Paleolithic, right? We have the idea the people in the Paleolithic all they were six. I mean, one eighty meters or six foot tall, and uh, uh, and super strong, you know, and uh, and they could hold up a, a bear with one hand and a lion with the other one and and and, and eat him alive, right? That's probably not true, right? They were probably very. Uh, slim, very uh, fragile people who were to survive and didn't have the strength to overtake a lion or a bear, or a bear right? But uh, yeah, they were hunter-gatherers. They would, could hunt whenever they could. But in the meantime, hey, they, they had a um, um, uh, plant-based diet. And the, the diet in these people is uh, somewhere between 65 and 70% in carbohydrates, right? Which is about 34, 33, 30 to 35% higher than the U.S. in carbohydrates. And they have uh, about 15, 25% protein and only about 10, 14% fat. So um, this is, this is the, 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 the paradox, right, of these populations who have um, almost uh, non-existent levels of obesity, of type 2 diabetes, of cardiovascular disease, and uh, yet they have very high um, 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 uh, concentration of carbohydrates in their diets. Mm. Yeah, it sort of puts to rest this idea that carbohydrates or glucose are inherently bad for metabolic health. That must be something that you, as someone who is so close with the research in this area and conducting your own studies, you must shake your head when you come across those sort of claims. Yeah, and and I I always go back to to the same thing, and it's just like uh, yeah, if if you don't have good functioning mitochondria, and if you have carbohydrates, that's bad. That's 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 as I said earlier, that's adding gas to the fire. That's going to make your condition worse because you need to metabolize it, and and therefore yes, for for someone with a poor mitochondrial function, maybe a a, a more 
protein uh, based diet and carbohydrate, reducing it is it's needed, um, right? But if you are a healthy individual, you're you exercise, you're good, you know, like this this population that I described, right? They 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 do in one day what is the recommended for uh, in our civilization for one week, which by the way, very few individuals get to meet the 150 minutes required per week, right? So these people, is, I would love at some point to travel to these areas and do a muscle biopsy of these populations and see their mitochondrial function because I'm very sure it's going to resemble a lot to, to those that we see in, 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 uh, in, in, in you know, very fit individuals who exercise a lot. And they have the same eating habits, right? Uh, eating a high-carbohydrate diet, low-fat, and moderating protein. 